Hello! There is much excitement today because I have got the Walks Now Avatar FPV goggles along with the brand new HD kit version 2 and the HD kit Pro uh, which has the sort of night type camera and it works with Gyroflow and stuff. I am coming quite late to the party with this. The reason being is I wanted to see where digital goes. As you know, or as you might know, I've done some playing around with OpenHD and I'm still continuing to do that. I've got my wing ready to hopefully take out tomorrow and have a play with. But I was kind of waiting to see how things would settle and deciding what I would like. And mostly I decided that I didn't want DJI because, I mean, they look very good. The quality is very nice and I see people absolutely loving them. I just don't like what DJI is doing in terms of like the, the fact you have to register your goggles before they'll work and just the fact they decide to build in remote ID on their goggles, I, I don't want, I don't trust that. HD Zero again look really good, but they seem to be going very much the low latency route for, for um, the racing sort of thing. And I was looking at walks now and you know, I really like the Caddx cameras and they seem to really listen to what the community wants and do stuff about it and produce really nice gear. So I thought, let's go walks now. now one thing to note about this, often I do review items and I don't pay for them at all. So people might think that if I haven't paid for it, then I'm going to give a positive review, in which case you might want to look at some of my reviews because they're not all very positive. <laughs> but in this case, um, Walksnow offered me a 30% discount. So I have had to put in for myself. Um, they did send the, the Pro Kit for free. The rest is my money um, paying for this less 30%. For, for doing this sort of video. Um, so I have to thank my wonderful patrons for helping me out because I can't buy stuff like this just with the proceeds of YouTube. It's, uh, <laughs> you just gotta get enough. So many thanks patrons. Hey, if you wanna become a patron, you can be one of these lovely people scrolling down the screen who are awesome. Um, details at the end of the video or the description. Anyway, so I'm late to the party. I haven't really watched anybody's impressions about these. When it was early on I was looking at the footage and I never really saw people going through the goggles and stuff so I don't know what's going on. You might have seen that before but I'm gonna go through it all again because this is my first view of them so I'm gonna sort of take them out of the box see what's happening. I've no idea how to like make it work with Betaflight how you get the OSD going and stuff like that I think it'd be interesting. I'm aiming to put I think one of these on a quad and one on a plane but I think even before I get there I might do some testing on the bench just to see how it all works and, and what I need to know but join me on my little journey. Okay so let's get them out of the box and show you what we get. This basically everything comes in this handy to carry around little case which is something you just shove in your bag with all your other kit. And of course if we look at what's in here we get this little quick start guide We've got uh, a piece of foam. I presume that's for putting in here. We get a cleaning cloth. We get this XT60 to barrel plug. So that's how we're gonna run them. It does give a warning about like, there's no regulation there. So you can put in too many volts. And you would have thought that voltage is something that's talked about in the quick start guide, but it's not. The other thing I noticed just looking at this, and when we take the other stuff out, is we get two of uh, these little patches, one, two, and then in this bit, we get two of these little, I presume, Omnis. And I think, looking at the four holes, that they all used to be these. And if I look again at the box, it seemed like they were the same. And it doesn't say, either in the quick scout guide or actually in the instructions, about where the antennas go. I actually, the, the way I sort of thought, how do I tell? Is to look on the website at the, the picture of the goggles there. They show these ones on the front and these ones on the top. So that's that's a weird omission, I have to say. So just looking around the goggles, and I, I have taken these out and, and tried them on and stuff and I've taken the little bits off there. We've got, and I guess, this is perhaps where this thing fits, maybe up there or something. These are the eyepieces, and those are controlled by the IPD. You push them in, you can control the diopter by twisting these. Now, these go down to minus six, which is just about on my eyesight. 
um, but doesn't account for things like astigmatism and things like that so be aware that it might not be perfect and what you don't have is any room to put any any regular diopters in front of those. So just to take you around what all these things do, what we've got here with the nice red button is the record for the internal DVR. This button here is a back button whereas this is like the five-way joystick push it in and get to the menu and then you can navigate around by pushing the stick around. This is the fan unit. I, I, Presumably that's low fan, high fan, something like that. It's listed in the quick scatter guide as anti-fog control, so you know, kind of makes sense. On the underside, as mentioned, you've got the IPD adjustment, you just push in and out. I've, I have actually put these on and set this, so I don't want to mess with them, just because it took me quite a while just to get it just perfect for myself. Uh, this is a power button, that's a bit of a, a weird thing on goggles for me. So used to like fat sharks not having them. And this is USB-C, for getting video out, which is a much better idea than the normal HDMI uh, plugs you'd get because they are big bulky cables and they're liable to fall out easily. The last thing you've got, if you just look here, is the slot to put the SD card for your DVI recording and stuff. So that's the goggles. What we'll do first off is of course put the antennas on. Because these goggles also transmit as well as receive, it's quite important to not power them up unless you do have the antennas on. So we'll get these on and we'll go over and see what we can do in the setup and the menu. Fortunately, I think I should be able to use, oh, yeah, that's that's where the power input goes for about that. For, as I say, fortunately, I think I should be able to use this video out to record the video directly to my computer so I don't have to think about um, how I'm gonna record that. But let's let's see, shall we? Okay, so trying them on my face and turn them on. One word of warning here is the voltage range here is seven to 21 volts. If, if you can't do that quickly in your head, 21 volts is a fully charged 5S battery. So don't go 6S. I've got this nice big 4S, which should be fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in, turn them on and give you my sort of impression about how they feel. And of course that's very subjective. Everyone's face is different. Everybody feels stuff differently. Um, so I'm going to turn them on. You can probably just hear the little fan whir up because I've got it on max fan basically because I'm inside with no airflow. And yeah, I mean, they are, I think, fairly heavy on the nose, which take a little bit of getting used to and perhaps that's what that little thing's for. So what I've got now is the, the main screen, but not really showing me anything. I'm gonna now connect these up. The reason I'm not gonna do it um, while they're on my face is because I've got a USB-C to HDMI thing that looks like this, and then that goes into a capture card and that goes into the computer. So let me connect that up, come back, and we'll go through the menu, see what's going on. Just before we move on, a quick update on this little bit, which I wasn't sure if this was like a nose thing or something else. And I asked my friend and audio colleague, Stephen, who's also got these goggles, hey, do you know what this is for? Is it for the nose? And he said, have a look at the underside of the goggles around the eyepiece section. And if you look there, you will see there's these little things jammed in there. And basically this looks like this is a spare one of those. Maybe, I mean, those look like they're sort of tapered off, so maybe this goes around the nose or something. So this is quite interesting itself. I don't know if this is specifically for a type of face. Obviously, you could take them out if you didn't want it. Um, it's obviously to help it sit on the cheekbones a little easier. And maybe this upper piece would go in behind the, the Velcro here or will replace one of those. But, uh, you know, it, at the moment it fits okay. Maybe I'll do an experiment with that and see what I can find. Okay, so we've got the main screen up and you can see that, you know, not much is going on because I haven't got an SD card in, I haven't got anything connected, but I thought I'd just go through the menu situation at the moment. Obviously we could see from our goggles point of view, we've got 16.7 volts from the battery, no megabits per second, obviously the transmitter is disconnected, no signal, that's kind of makes sense and, and no SD. So if I go ahead and just press the, the five-way button, it goes into the menu here and the menu tells us well, we've got three channels, so I'm on I'm on a particular range of things, and it's quite. Which is when you want to go sideways, the button is like which which way does it want to orientate? Oh, I see. So back and forth, right. 
So if we look, these are the channels first off, and then we've got our settings here. Uh, and if we go into device, I think the, th the thing is probably useful is device info. And that tells us that our Google software version is 28.32.10. And I know from looking at the site that the up-to-date version is 32.37.10. So perhaps the first thing we want to do is actually update this. So for that, I'm going to need to get an SD card, put that software on and try updating this. But in the meantime, I don't think there's too much to do here. There's some instructions okay and it's just what I find slightly tricky is thinking about what's up and what's down and what's left and right when you're you're sort of talking about you know up and downs that way left and right would be that way but it doesn't seem to quite go like that have, have I got an option of channels because I have the option of being like FCC or something like that, so I get more channels and stuff like that. Don't know. First thing, let's try doing the software update, and for that, I think I just need to put it onto a blank SD card, put the SD card in, turn it on, and see what happens. So you'll find all the firmware for the WalkSnail on the Cadex FPV download page. It comes as a single zip file with multiple firmwares in there. And if you look inside that directory, you get a whole bunch of images with a handy README JPEG to tell you what's going on. So the main uh, avatar ground image is for the goggles, the sky is for the VTXs, and then you've got special firmware for the, what's that, the Fat Shop Scout, is it? I can't remember. And then the, the Walk Snail sort of add on that you can plug into your regular goggles. So, what I'm going to do is just drop this ground onto my SD card and put it in the goggles and do the next stage. Okay, so the goggles are plugged back in, the memory card is in there, and we have to press the link button for about eight seconds, which I didn't point out before. It's this little tiny hole next to the five way joystick, and you'll need something to poke in there, like this little screwdriver -y thing. So, I'm going to go ahead and poke that screwdriver in and then count to. Yeah, eight. So it's press and hold the link button on the goggles for eight seconds and the goggles automatically restart in a minute and beep, beep, beep a sound. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, they're rebooting and it says the upgrade time on the goggle is about six minutes, which is quite a while. So I won't be filming all of this. Oh, there's there's the beeps. That's good. Which means it's powering back up again. So it will apparently keep beeping like this. It says after the upgrade is successful and the beeping sound stops after the goggles beeps for five seconds. Okay. And while it's doing this, it's not putting out a signal via the USB lead to the HDMI, so I can't show you what's happening. But it's just showing me the title screen, so it's nothing exciting. I'll, I'll come back when this is finished, shall I? That was a fun lot of beeping. After it beeped, 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 it then did this big beep for about five seconds, and that's when it restarted the goggles again, and it came up, and we're left with our goggle software version of 32.37.10, which is good, and we've now got an SD card showing 108.8 .8 gigs free, so that's good. However, they're no good just like this because we need something to connect them to. So let's have a look at one of the VTXs and see what we need to do to get one of these going and maybe we can actually look at something through the goggles. That would be fun, wouldn't it? So here are my two Avatar HD version 2s with the Pro here and the, the regular one here. They're both pretty much the same in terms of the VTX. It's just the camera is slightly different. So I'll just get one out of the box to show you what's going on. Ugh, big pull. And we've got a sort of... Uh, little cheat sheet of the manual there which you won't be able to read which is essentially the same sort of online menu but you get in the box the main VTX unit attached with the camera with a fairly decent length cable probably about eight nine inches maybe maybe a bit shorter this is the plug for the um, the UART control the power and ground these can take up to a 6S battery directly, but they say if you're going to use it on 6S, put some capacitors in. I notice most flight controllers now give sort of an 8 or 9 volt output to run things like DJI, and so that might be 
the way to go. On the other side you've got this one here which I believe is the one that attaches to the USB because you need to potentially upgrade it and we should, I think we've got the just gyro flow version with lots of memory so we should have an option to take stuff off. So this is the adapter for that, that's the USB. Uh, down here you've got some cables that's just going to come in the power and you outside so we can then solder that directly to a flight control if we want to and uh, here we've got a bunch of fittings which is quite handy it says it's got 20 and 25 mil holes right, at the moment to me they don't really look like holes more like, like screws that are screwed in but I'll figure out that bit in a second and of course we also need the antenna it's gone down to a single antenna instead of dual and it's got a little locking UFL connector there which goes in this bit here which we can't do I guess we take some bits off there I'm going to first work out how to get the antenna on and then we need to well presumably we've got to upgrade this so we need to connect it to USB and see how that works and then we can finally connect some power to it in some way and see you know if it gives us a signal and we can look in the goggles and look at stuff in HD won't that be exciting again I'm looking forward to it so let's figure out how this works first Okay, so I believe what happens is you take these screws out if you want to mount it and then you've potentially got these longer screws to go all the way through to a part of your stack or something like that. This bit at the back, if you take those screws out, there's this little metal thing that comes out and that uncovers the UFL adapter where you can put that in and obviously when you put it on, that is a way of making sure your antenna doesn't come off again. The only thing that kind of got me a little bit confused is the, the 20 by 20 mil holes which they're holes certainly and they seem threaded but they're not all the way through so if I try and put a screw in there I can get you know two or three turns on it and then it stops so I don't know if the idea is you'd kind of mount it with like a screw and then some rises or something like that I'm not sure uh, as it is 25 by 25 is kind of a weird one it seems to be either 30.5 mil or 20, but not 25. Then again, I see a lot of quads having spaces at the back to put these down as well. So maybe you don't need that. Anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this on and I'm going to connect it up to USB and upgrade the firmware to the same version that I just upgraded the goggles to. Okay, so here's what we got. In this one, this goes to the little USB adapter, which is USB-C. This goes to power. I've just connected up this little jazz here. I've got this 3S here to connect. I'm going to connect that now. And you need to power it to actually get USB to come up. Okay, USB power is in. And we get this little untitled uh, disc come up. And we've got some little flashing lights there. So I have got this thing here. This is Sky, which is what you use. Drag that down to this untitled, which has 32 gig of storage and we copy that over, then basically we can disconnect that from USB and press this button down, which is again the link button for another eight seconds and that should do the upgrade. Okay, so it's powered up again. I'm gonna hold down that button for eight seconds. If I can find a button. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it says I can let go once it goes off. That makes it restart. And then it restarts in upgrade mode. And it should go into blinking red, which it's doing, which means it's upgrading. It then goes to solid red, and then it will turn off. And that means the upgrade's done. It only takes about 20 seconds, which is a lot better than sort of six minutes. <laughs> the other thing did it, which is how long the goggles took. It says after upgrade successful, the VTX indicator turns green and blinks. We've got that. All right, now we can try hooking it up to the goggles. Okay, so I'm going to try and connect things up. And to do that, I, I'm using this webcam because I can I can switch where I am. But basically, I've switched the goggles on. Hopefully, you can uh, see that because I'm recording it. And I'm just going to switch the VTX on here as well. If I try and film what I'm doing down here, here's what I've got. Here are my goggles. Here's the VTX. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do a short press of the link button in the goggles, which is here using the little screwdriver. And we get a little beep, beep, beep. And I'm going to do a short press of the 
button there. And that's gone to red. And it's flashing. And what we've got? It says we've got no signal <laughs> on the HDMI. Well, I can see it just fine in my goggles. So why did I lose that signal on my HDMI capture? Well, basically it's because although I'm using this uh, Elgato HD60S+, Plus, which is a pretty good uh, capture card, it's not that well supported on Mac. So for example, it doesn't do uh, HDR or uh, very high resolution stuff. Whereas you use it on a PC, Windows PC, you can do all sorts. Anyway, the goggles by default put out a high frame rate of 100 frames per second. And that seemed to be having a problem when it was sort of rejigging its sync signal when it was getting uh, the video through. Um, and I was having the same problem with my gaming monitor because that likes to talk in 60 hertz or 120 or 144, but not 100. So the way around that after a bit of struggling around was to set the frame rate to standard and that puts out a 60 frames per second signal, 60 hertz. Um, and if you got stuck, then try experimenting between 720 and 1080p. By doing that, I managed to get some capture. All I was trying to do is capture the uh, goggles own OSD with what you see, just to give you guys an impression. It would not normally be something I'd worry about because uh, I'd be recording the DVR and I wouldn't worry about anything else, but I just wanted to show you guys that. But I think it is worth saying that if you are gonna use the USB to HDMI, then just make sure your monitor can handle it or you might have to fiddle around with the goggles settings sometimes. Anyway, what I'm going to do is go through what was in the goggles and what it all means, basically. Okay, so we've got some screen capture here from the standard camera. I'm just going to pause this in a really bad spot so you can look at my face. And I'm just going to go through exactly what we can see on the goggles here. So starting off the left-hand side, we've got the voltage going into the air unit, which is 11 volts. Uh, the next one is the goggle voltage, pretty obvious. Uh, then we've got our megabits per second rate, which is either 25 megabits per second or 50 megabits per second. By default, it's 25. After that, we've got our millisecond delay. So we've got a 34 millisecond latency between the camera and the goggles, which is pretty good. Then this thing that says 0M is 0 meters. That's the ranging mode. It tries to work out how far you are away um, using the sort of the, the round trip sort of idea about how long it's taking to get there and stuff. The next thing you got is the status bar, and this says standby mode. Standby mode means the goggles and the VTX are in the lowest power, which is about 10 milliwatts. And by default, this is set up not to activate and go to whatever power you've put it on, unless you arm your quad or, or whatever. That could be turned off, but even at 10 milliwatts, I have to warn you, these things can overheat very quickly on the bench, the VTX that is. So I've got mine sort of sat in front of a fan trying to cool it as, as well as I can there. Next thing along, you've got the channel and the signal strength. Now, channel-wise, it's all set via the goggles. It's a two-way situation, so when you, you say, okay, I'm changing to channel whatever, the VTX will do the same thing, and you don't have to worry about it. And then up the top, you've got the amount of space left on your own SD card, and then under that where it says 27.1G, that is the amount of space left on the VTX. I bought the VTXs with the 32 gig of memory, which allow you to use gyroflow. But if you get the lower ones, I think they've only got eight gig of memory and can't do gyroflow. So let's go into settings whilst I've got this in front of the fan on my knee. And you'll notice we've now got eight channels. So I've made a change here. Also, if we go into settings and go to transmit power, we've got 25 milliwatts, 200, 500, 700, 1000 and 1200. So I've set this to FCC and I'll quickly show you how you do that. So first off, why would you want to use FCC? And the reason is you get eight channels and you can unlock the high bitrate option, which is not the same as unlocking the power, which is a different thing. Of course, I have to make one caveat to this to say you need to make sure that you're allowed to run FCC where you are or the higher power. But, you know, that is up to you. Anyway, it, it mentions in this uh, Q&A document that you put two text files in the SD card and then start the glasses. What are the text files? If we go back to the download page, we will find out here you've got an FCC unlock procedure. If we go into that, there are two files and an unlock procedure document that basically says this. 
you just pop this avatar standard text to unlock eight channels and the avatar power text unlocks 1200 milliwatts and 1000 milliwatts transmit power and there's precious little in these files if you want to know exactly what's in them in the power.txt file we have the number one and then the standard text file we have the number two and that is enough to unlock all that stuff stick them in your goggles and you are go so if we take a look in the goggle view now the the most obvious one we have is the channel settings right now this is set to channel two as you can see there is this thing called auto up the top there but according to the documentation this automatically refreshes how good the channels are rather than set you to an automatic channel and refresh does a manual refresh and you can see i'm inside the house there are 5.8 wireless devices and so we've got several channels which aren't as good as the others obviously what you'd be doing is is turning on finding the best looking channel and choosing that one for wherever you are if i was using the high bit rate i'd only have four channels available and that's because they use a larger range of the 5.8 spectrum but this is in standard bit rate mode if we go into settings and look at the camera first off pretty much uh, standard sort of things you'll see you've got different scene components you can change the sharpness the ratio most of this is set to all auto or uh, sort of very you know conservative regular settings it's not something I've touched as yet really because I haven't flown them if we go into display option this zoom out thing kind of confused me I thought this might change the size of the screen you're seeing in the background just in case like you know it's too big for you so if I set it to 60% and then leave the menu um, it doesn't seem to have changed it looks exactly the same so I didn't really know what to do with that so I I went back in and put it back to normal I get the impression I'm not going to know too much about this stuff until I try it out properly obviously brightness makes sense um, the custom OSD why is that set to auto what's that mean custom font and font update makes sense because the fonts you're getting for your OSD um, all are supplied by the goggles and not from Betaflight or iNav or whatever and thus the OSD position must be about how that works I don't know what the viewfinder is or the viewfinder edit and I didn't find much info on the documentation focus mode I'm assuming is like the DJI focus mode when it kind of goes a bit dodgy around the edges and fine in the middle but I'm absolutely not sure so I'm gonna mostly leave this stuff until I get out flying something and then we'll see what happens the main settings menu makes a lot more sense and one of the things there is the the goggle icon so this turns the uh, its own OSD on and off and I noticed there's also an option to put it on with the FC because maybe you want to see what your latency is as for the other stuff well we already know what the transmit power does and the frame rate does and obviously low battery warnings useful resolution goes between 720p and 1080p standby mode which is where it puts it into 10 milliwatts it's on by default and as i said that means when you arm your quad it goes into its its power whether that be 25 milliwatts or 1200 milliwatts the only reason you might want to turn that off is of course if you don't have a flight controller and you're just flying this in something without it then it doesn't know if it's armed or not so that's when you want it off and i'm not sure what broadcast does and there's no documentation so it goes on my li long list of extra things to find out for next time if we go into record set it basically tells us how we're going to record stuff and we've got the vtx recording here set to 1080p 60 this is the internal recording on the vtx as you might expect we've also got recording device both and takeoff recording is on so that's two things if I hit the record button on the goggles it records both ways but also if I just take off without hitting the recording button on the goggles then the VTX recording should go and then we've got options to format the SD card or format the VTX I do notice we've got a recording loop as well for both I'm assuming that only comes in if the SD card or the memory fills up and it sort of loops over and starts re-recording over the top of it so if I went ahead and hit the record button and decided to make a recording and I'll, I'll just show you a few seconds of this you can see what I'm up to doing weird things and that's my fan trying to cool this down if we then went into the playback menu we've got a list of our recorded things there and here's my one playing back you'll notice there it had an option to have OSD recording or not and in this case although OSD is on that records the OSD of your flight controller not the goggle OSD 
So enough about menus, what's it actually look like? So I decided to split this into three sections and the first time I'm using the standard camera and I'm outdoors. And this is in the DVR, just recorded at 60 frames a second at 720p. And in this is a little bit of an overcast day, it's not amazing, but I think the, the standard camera looks quite reasonable here. I think we'd be flying this without absolutely any problems at all. If we switch over to the pro camera, there's not that much difference. I was quite surprised here how little difference there is because I've already checked this in night and indoors and the difference there is amazing. But if you are flying during the daytime in a, a you know reasonable day where you have natural light, you'll get a decent picture out of both cameras. But now let me show you what this looks like in an indoor environment without natural light. So here's what the standard camera looks like indoors. Now I filmed this first off when I was still trying to do lots of setup and record videos through the goggles and stuff. And I noticed just how grainy this is. It really doesn't like it. Now we've got a tiny bit of natural light coming in via the blind on the left hand side, but it's mostly from an overhead light. And it's mainly, it's noisy, it doesn't look as sharp, and that's probably because of the noise. You can kind of see things on the wall kind of flickering about. Not very good at all, but have a look at the pro camera there is such a massive difference with this picture now one might say oh it looks a little bit oversaturated perhaps so and you could turn it down but mostly it's free of noise um it hasn't got any sort of flickering it's much sharper because of it and it just looks um 100 better so absolutely fine if you're outdoors but if you're indoors or at night then maybe think pro cameras for you but let's have a look how the night performance is hello you probably can't see me it's half past nine I'm outside in my garden. This is what the phone picks up. And I wanted to check out how well the low light abilities of both cameras work. Uh, let me just switch to the front camera. You might see a bit more. Okay, so you can see here the conservatory's lit up a bit. We've got a street light up there, but it's fairly dark in the garden. You can see the deck here, and then it goes much darker over there into the darkness. So it'd be interesting to see how these compare. I'll do a DVR recording and we'll see what happens. Right, so kicking off with the standard camera, and just to set the scene, I'm literally walking around in the dark with goggles on my head and a camera in my hand. So neighbours are forewarned there's a crazy person. And this looks about what uh, I see with the naked eye, maybe just a touch better. And it's very tricky walking off steps. We're picking up some stuff where there's a little bit of, of light from stuff. But as we get into the darker sections of the garden, it's uh, it's pretty scary stuff. and I can't really see anything. But looking back into the light, not too bad. I wouldn't fly anything with this for sure. It's far too dark. Um, but it does it does you know about average. It it does what you'd expect from a camera that doesn't have any particular low light abilities. This is down my alleyway, which is very very dark. I always use for a sort of a, a test thing. And here's what the program receives, and oh my goodness, what a difference. This looks like it's being floodlit. It's taking that small amount of light from that street light and the conservatory, and it's really amplifying it. And, you know, it's getting a lot of noise where it's very tough to light, but this is way beyond what I can see with the naked eye. This is so, so much more impressive. It, it just sort of shows that you only need a little bit of light to be able to use it or flying it. I would be perfectly happy flying under these sort of situations. Now, obviously this only works because it's amplifying the small amount of light it's got. If you take it into a seriously dark place where there is no light, then it's not gonna perform anything magic. So I'm going right to the, the very darkest area of my garden. And you can see the amount of noise it's picking up is amazing. And down this alleyway is completely pitch black and it's not able to find any light to amplify. It gets very noisy. Um, but if we look back, then you can really see how that just quite useless street light in, in normal conditions is lighting up the whole garden. So you really don't need much. So a decent moonlit day, um, car parks at night with a couple of small lights you will be able to fly around like it's daytime so i am i'm pretty wowed by the performance of the pro camera in perfect sunlight the standard camera does a brilliant job just as good but if your light is less than perfect the pro camera does an amazing thing so if you go ahead and have a look at what's on the internal storage of the VTX, and I've copied this to my local directory, you get the MP4 files and you get the GCSV files, which you can use in GyroFlow to stabilize your footage. Little extra things are the version.txt, and I've still got the image on there for when I 
put the updated firmware on. And if we look at the stuff that we get, we get, uh, yeah, it's 1080p footage in 60 FPS and the data rate is about 51 megabits per second. And this is the stuff I took with the pro camera a bit earlier on. And it looks pretty much identical to what you get in the DVR. But I'll be doing more about how we can use GyroFlow and stuff like that when I actually come to fly this thing. Now, the more observant of you may have noticed that, hey, you haven't flown anything with this yet, but this video in my editor is already 34 minutes long and I, that doesn't include this bit or anything else. So I'm gonna come back to that bit. Think of this as a bit of a deep dive onto how this work, what the buttons do, what the output from these guys looks like. And in the next video, I'm gonna actually get a beta flight quad and try and fly it around. That may not be using this. Um, hopefully will be because I've got a quad and a plane lined up to put those VTXs in. But I've also got from my buddies at URFPV this little Happy Model baseline, which runs on 2S. It has a tiny little walk snail compatible camera and VTX in it, and also on ELRS, which looks great fun. So I'll be flying that and I'll be installing these guys into the various things. And at that point, I'll be talking about how we install things, how we get it set up with hopefully. Uh, both Betaflight and iNav. And the other thing I want to do is understand some of those things on the goggles that I didn't understand in the menus. What what does broadcast do? What's the whole sharing menu for? I don't know. Anyway, I hope you join for that one. In the meantime, of course, if you want to check out any of these products, there are going to be links down below where you can find them and check them out. So I hope that's been useful to you. I'm really excited to get flying these and check it out and see how it all works. So I'll be back as soon as I can be to do that. In the meantime, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye for now. Well, you've made it to the end of the video, so thanks once again for watching. If you like what you saw, then please consider subscribing. And if you really like what you saw, then be sure to check out the link to my blog for a variety of ways in which you can help support this channel.